So as a kid, I loved sports. Actually, I still do. I watch sports all the time. My favorites are probably soccer and basketball. And while I didn't really play soccer growing up, I did try my hand at basketball. One day when I was in middle school, my middle school basketball coach said something to me. He pulled me aside after practice and he said, Danny, yeah, he was the only person that's ever called me Danny. You're a real good basketball player, but you couldn't shoot the ball into the ocean. Heartbroken, I realized that day that my dream of becoming a professional basketball player was probably not going to happen. Fortunately, I found another profession, the profession of the historian. And it's that profession that I want to talk about in this video. In this video, we're going to look at professional history, where it came from, and what it looks like today, and what some of the consequences of that process of professionalization had on history writing in the 19th century. Okay, let's do it. Alright, this video is going to be divided into three parts. In the first part, we're going to look at what we mean by professional history. What is professional history today? Second, we're going to look at where professional history came from. Where historically does professionalization begin in the historical profession, um, and why does it happen? And then finally, we're going to end this video by looking at some of the consequences of this process of professionalization, specifically in the 19th and very early 20th century. Okay, first things first, what is professional history? Okay, so the question is, what is professional history? Well, we've talked a little bit about this in the past when we've talked about the different kind of forms of history. And I showed you this graphic. This is a simple way to kind of look at how history often manifests itself in lots of different ways. For example, there's academic history that manifests itself in universities and things like that. Public history that shows up in museums and in other uh, places like that. And popular history in things like movies and fiction and video games. Professional history is essentially just academic history. It's the kind of history that's done in places where academics are. So what do we mean by academic history exactly? Well, first we mean that it's history done in certain institutions. The institutions that we can think about as the primary places where academic history happens are places like universities and colleges, but also historical societies too. For example, the main historical society in the United States is the American Historical Association. And you can see from its website, from its description on its website, that it sort of identifies itself as a professional organization for historians. You can see that it was founded in 1884, in the exact time that we're talking about the, the rise of professional history. And its purpose is for protecting academic freedom, yes, um, and providing leadership for the discipline, but also developing professional standards and supporting scholarship and innovative teaching. The AHA is essentially a forum for the work of professional historians. So it's one of the institutions that professional historians work through. The second major thing about academic history is that academic history tends to be history produced by people who are trained in the same way. So the first thing we can think of is that professional historians tend to have degrees in history. Usually for professional academics, that means a PhD in history. I got my PhD in history at Ohio State University after I wrote a dissertation and after I took lots of classes and research seminars and learned the kind of craft of history and practiced it. That's the kind of training that professional historians get. Professional historians also publish. They publish generally three main types of things, and I've mentioned this before in class, but those things are books, articles in scholarly journals, 
and essays in scholarly volumes. So the work of professional historians tends to be the works that show up in these forms. Finally, professional historians tend to adopt certain norms or professional uh, behaviors. For example, professional historians submit things that, go, that undergo peer review. You'll read about this when we look at professionalization later on in the semester, but peer review is just a way of ensuring that the work that historians do is reliable, is methodologically sound, and is trustworthy. Second, the second norm is that professional historians tend to always have a practice of citing their sources and attributing their, uh, the information that they use in their writings to the sources that they pull them from. Finally, professional historians all try to produce original research. The idea of professional history is that you're going back into the past and uncovering something that someone hasn't really talked about before, whether it be a, a topic that they haven't focused on or an interpretation they haven't made, or maybe even just sources they haven't used. The whole point of professional history is to uncover something new, to do something original. All right, so now you know how to go pro in history. Next thing we're going to look at is where did this process of professionalization come from? All right, where does professional history come from? Well, the first answer to this is from the sort of idea of a science of history. This notion of a science of history really connects all the way back to the Enlightenment. If you remember our last lecture, you'll remember that the Enlightenment was really kind of the culmination of a few centuries worth of progress in the historical discipline, or not progress so much as change in the historical discipline. Source criticism really reached a, a kind of point of influence by the 18th century, and historians began to really look at their sources and consider good sources versus bad sources and ways to get at more accurate depictions of the past. That gave Enlightenment historians a real sense of um, confidence in their writing of history and in the way that they approach the past. And that turned into, eventually, a sort of idea or a notion that history could become a science. You could approach the past the exact same way that you approach, say, a, I don't know, a science experiment in a lab. You could use the scientific method. You could come up with a question and then design a way to research that question, find evidence and do experiments, and then analyze the data that's from those experiments and report the conclusions. This whole idea of a science of history was essentially a kind of push towards empiricism towards making history a function of empirical inquiry. And this gets sort of codified in the history world through a term called historicism. One of the best definitions of historicism comes from uh, the German historian Friedrich Meinecke, who said this, historicism is essentially the substitution of a process of individualizing observation for a generalizing view of human forces in history. Okay, what does that mean? Well, that essentially means that history is the study of the particular. It is not a study of how all humans behave. Rather, it is just a study of how particular humans in a particular past behaved for particular reasons. This idea that the science of history needs to be sort of motivated by historicism, right, or by the, the study of the particular, became a central feature to a kind of German school of historiography that came up in the 19th century, labeled Geschichte Wissenschaft, or the science of history. This approach really made historicism very popular and made the science or the sort of empirical research of history, the empirical approach to history, the main way that history began to be taught in Germany. What historicists believe they were doing in studying history this way, right, as a science, is they believed that they were getting a more objective understanding of the past. This is best represented by Ranka's phrase, vs eigentlich gewesen, which essentially just means as it happened, or, or history as it actually happened. The idea here, right, is that historicists thought they were understanding the past in a purer and in a more objective way way than any historians before. There was another manifestation of the science of history, though, 
Karl Marx became a kind of leader of a different type of scientific history. Called materialist history, the idea was that history should only explain change by way of material functions, material matters. In other words, Marx thought that the reason that things happened could be boiled down to sort of natural causes and consequences seeing essentially things like ideas as sort of byproducts of material factors, he looked at all history through the lens of natural functions, things like the struggle for food, the struggle for resources, the struggle for things that were very tangible and concrete. And this became sort of the basis for materialist history, a kind of different type of science of history that was less about just sort of empirical research and more about using natural explanations for the how and why of the past. So the science of history eventually got institutionalized. And the main figure who sort of did this work was Leopold von Ranke. Ranke took this idea of historicism and the idea of the science of history and sort of used it as a way to change the discipline itself and to make the discipline of history into something unique, unique from philosophy, unique from theology, unique from all these other disciplines that already existed in the university. So how did he do that? Well, first, he normalized the process of doing archival research. You see, for Ranka, doing the science of history meant making sure that you set up your experiments well. And for him, the best way to set up an experiment for the past was to find the, the sources and the data that were closest to the past as possible. That meant going into archives and finding manuscript sources, you know, those original documents from the past, and basing his historical writing on those things rather than printed um, editions or, or retranslations of past documents. Second, Ranka adopted the sort of ideology of historicism. He made history less about moral lessons or um, wisdom for the future or for the present even, and more about just understanding the past on its own terms. Third, Ranka really popularized the use of citations to show where evidence was coming from and where sources were coming from. He's certainly not the first person to do this. Citations and footnotes had been around long before Ranka, but Ranka was really the one that kind of popularized this and normalized it for, historic, for professional historians. Fourth, Ranka helped set up and helped sort of support the creation of historical journals, academic journals specifically for the subject of history. And these types of historical journals popped up everywhere, in the United States, in Germany, in France, in England, uh, even in Japan. Fifth, the way that Ranka taught history at the university was through the, fun the, the sort of methodology of the research seminar. So instead of just giving information or giving narratives about the past to his students, he would expect the students to create those narratives by looking at primary sources by using the kind of empirical data that they could get and constructing the histories themselves. And finally, Ranka supported the creation of historical associations. These are those societies that I mentioned before that came up to help kind of provide guidelines and professional standards for historians in countries all around the world. And Ranka's model eventually spread to the rest of the globe. We can look at the example of Japan as uh, one kind of case study in this. The Meiji Revolution that happened in Japan in the mid-19th century brought about a kind of push towards westernization in the, in the country. As a part of that, Japanese intellectuals started to look for other models for going about their disciplines. One great example is Fukuzawa Yukichi. Yukichi was a historian who really adopted the kind of historicist or scientific history approach that became really dominant in Germany. And one of the ways he applied this was by kind of writing revisionist histories of previous Japanese and Asian, uh, East Asian histories. So, for example, he pushed away from the model of using history as a way to sort of teach moral lessons and instead adopted the kind of historicist model of just understanding the past on its own terms. Taguchi Ukichi also did a similar thing and applied it to specifically Japanese history. Ukichi especially moved a lot of Japanese historiography away from just the stories of dynastic progression to questions of culture and questions of society. But the final example of the Ronkian revolution spreading to other parts of the world really is, is best sort of shown through the figure of Ludwig Reis. Reis was a German historian who eventually was employed by 
the Meiji government to work at the University of Tokyo. He became the first history professor at the University of Tokyo and brought the Ronkian kind of approach to history to the country and to that university. And one of the things he ended up doing there was helping to establish a journal of history, an academic journal of history called Shigaku Zashi. This became the first professional academic journal for the discipline of history in the country of Japan. So professionalization comes from a very specific time and place. Now I want to look a little at some of the consequences of this process. What did it mean and what did it do to history when professional history sort of came about and was institutionalized in Germany and Europe and everywhere else? The idea of a science of history certainly proved valuable for the historical profession going on. In fact, we still practice history in a lot of the ways that Ranka and the people around him sort of came up with. But in the 19th and 20th century, there were also consequences, unintended consequences, of adopting this kind of model of a science of history. First is that the pr practitioners of this science of history really saw it as the best way to understand the past. In fact, the only really trustworthy way of understanding the past. This kind of fed into narratives of superiority, oftentimes Eurocentrism, and, and thus with the professionalization of history, we see the rejection of a lot of other historical traditions that existed throughout the world, especially historical traditions from places like India and Africa and the Global South. And this superiority could get really problematic. Heinrich von Treitzky was a historian of the Ronkian model in Germany. In fact, he took over Ronka's position at the University of Berlin after Ronka retired. A dogged historicist and practitioner of the science of history, he nevertheless came up with kind of theories that led him to believe that Germans were superior in all sorts of ways because they had invented this science of history. This led to Trotsky writing all sorts of works that were intensely nationalistic and anti-Semitic. The way that the science of history was practiced, moreover, in the, son of, in the school of Ranka and others like him, meant that certain varieties of history were sort of privileged over others. For example, Ranka really believed in the power of archival sources. And this was really easy for Ranka because at the time that he was practicing history, more and more countries were starting to establish national archives. The thing is, national archives tend to have very specific types of documents. And those documents tend to be largely political in nature. They're government documents or, or diplomatic documents or documents having to do with the state. So if you believe that really the best material for history comes from archives, and the archives that you have to work with are almost entirely political in nature, then you'd be led to believe that the best way to understand history is to understand it through the lens of political history. But as we'll see in the next video, lots of professional historians who believed in historicism, who believed in sort of the empirical approach to history, nonetheless saw the focus on political history as being problematic as overlooking certain peoples whose stories also deserve to be told. Finally, we can think about some of the consequences of the professionalization of history through the application of certain methods for training and certain institutions to train professional historians. The fact of the matter was that the PhD was something that was really only open to certain types of people in the 19th and early 20th centuries. This is data about the American university system. And one thing that you can notice here is that in general, the people who were getting PhDs in American universities were, were by and large men. The professionalization of history often meant cutting women out of the process of writing history. Indeed, the first woman to ever get, get a PhD in history was not until 1893. Kate Everest got her, the first PhD in history for a woman in the United States from the University of Wisconsin. But she was very much an exception to the rule. Professionalization of history essentially meant that certain types of people would get certified as professional historians and others would be relegated to sort of non-professional status. This would eventually change, but in the early history of professionalization, we have to recognize the ways that professional history also excluded people and made the work of history into the kind of purview of a very small group of privileged elites. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, first, we've learned about the origins of the historical profession in a lot of ways. A lot of the norms and institutions and um, 
professional behaviors that professional historians instituted in the 19th century are still with us today. They still define what it means to be a professional historian, and they still dictate how we go about our craft. That said, the story of establishing professional history, or the professionalization of history in the 19th century, wasn't an uncontested one. In the next video, what you're going to see is that lots of people who were themselves professional historians pushed back on a lot of the assumptions and the consequences of the professionalization process. And in class, we're going to look at what professional history looks like in the various varieties of history that we've talked about all throughout this module. You're going to see scientific history sort of in action and how it was implemented in the 19th and early 20th centuries. All right, but until then, good job and see you in class.